skeptical right from the beginning, looking for data. Um, maybe I'll just start with that one. You know, I think uh, as, as someone who came to climbing a little later in life and who definitely does not have the best body type for climbing, um, I think the, the, I tend to stay focused on the fun. I tend to stay focused on, um, you know, how I can have the most fun climbing. Um, how to reduce pain or prevent. Yeah, we'll talk about that for sure. Inner and outer elbow pain. That's going to be a really common, um, common topic, I think, today. I think everybody wants to know about elbow pain. Um, so from a BMI perspective, you know, I don't have the best body type and I've sort of defaulted towards bouldering as a result away from rope climbing, which is what my wife is really excels at. And I love that powerful, um, style, uh, of bouldering. So I don't know, I would, you know, I've seen some amazingly talented climbers that don't have the, the ideal body type. So I don't, I don't, I guess I don't like people to get hung up on, on, um, too much of, too much of that because, um, you know, it, it's sort of, it's sort of uh, beside the point. The you can't change too much of your body type. Of course, you know, if you're willing to go to the extreme and uh, significantly change your diet and significantly change um, um, the way you're living your life, then you could certainly make some change. But those most of us are born with, you know, a certain amount of uh, of our body type that's unchangeable, whether it's our bone density or our muscle mass or sort of our relative height. Um, uh, limb length, all those things. A lot of those things are pretty fixed. So just go out and climb and enjoy yourself and know that like just through the process of climbing, your body's going to change. I mean, every time I've changed sports in my life as an athlete, I, uh, I've noticed my body change. Uh, it adapts to whatever I'm asking it to do. And so go climb and know that whatever body you get from eating well, training hard, climbing hard, um, that's going to be your ideal body type and don't get too hung up on comparing yourself. Um, welcome, welcome everybody. This is joining super psyched that you're all here. Um, let's see. Oh, we're getting some funny ones I like that. Let's bring a little humor in talking about chalk ability. That's a new term. Any other questions you guys want me to um, address here? We're definitely going to be talking about elbow pain today. We're definitely going to be talking about shoulder uh, stuff. Um, we can chat about pain in general. I might just start with that. Um, cool, guys. So I'm going to get started. Introduce myself. Um, for those that join a little bit later, I'll reintroduce myself. But I'm Charlie Merrill. I'm a physical therapist here in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I have a manual therapy practice and um, work on some of the best athletes in the world. That includes climbers, runners, cyclists. Um, I'm definitely a multi-sport athlete myself and I came to climbing later in my life. So maybe like a lot of you, it's something that I'm continually learning about. I'm definitely not a, a long-term um, climbing athlete in that way. So I'm learning new things all the time. And of course, through my elite clients, um, I learn a ton. So as I said, I'm based here in Boulder, Colorado. I'm curious for all of you, um, how many people are, are climbing outside uh, still? I'm doing very little because the front range is just packed with people and it's very hard to find uh, boulders and crags that aren't really crowded right now. So um, throw up some hearts if you're climbing outside. If you're still climbing outside a lot, I'd love to get a sense for, for that. Um, got a question about ankle sprains. Um, talk about that a little bit. Someone else wanted to know about running injuries. We'll get to that for sure. Um, anyway, uh, that's who I am. Um, I'm looking forward to, to talking with you today. I think, um, let's see, preventing TFCC injury. Yeah, there, that's come up a lot this week. I've noticed in some of the, the, um, the live talks here. Um, hand and wrist stuff, buzzing, nervy stuff. Yeah, a lot of symptoms. So I think I want to start, you know, um, I've been trained to look at things in biomechanical terms. So um, those of you that have, have looked into injury patterns and training, a lot of what you see is biomechanics, but I've also brought in what I would say is like a pain neuroscience um, or a pain science bent to how I talk about things. And so one of the first things I want to share with you guys 
is to debunk this myth that pain always means that we're injured. And I hear climbers talking about this all the time, this idea that um, if we have pain in our elbow or in our shoulder, that must mean that we have tissue damage. And I wanna let all of you know, this may be a little disorienting, that's just not how pain works. Um, more often than not in my practice, even in Boulder, one of the most active towns in the country, um, I find that um, a lot of athletes have pain without tissue damage. And what's nice about that is um, it trends well with this idea that just because you have pain doesn't mean you have to stop everything. Like there's value in continuing to train. And in fact, continuing to train for a lot of people is the way through, is the way back to climbing again. This idea of like shutting everything down and taking long breaks is kind of an old school solution to the pain problem. So um, just to, to briefly, two things I think that are really important to remember. If you didn't have a significant moment or trauma or moment when the pain started where there was a pop or swelling or bruising, if you didn't have a significant mechanism of injury, the likelihood that you injured something is pretty low. So we can have pain even at the beginning, sorry, we can have pain er early in the process and at where we call it acute and still have no tissue damage, still have no injury. Um, that said, the second thing I wanna share is the longer we've been in pain, the longer we've had symptoms, the less likely it is that we have tissue damage or a true injury. And that's because things heal. So let's say you tweak your A2 pulley and it's been six months and you still have sensitivity, you still have pain there, you're still limited. The likelihood that that pulley injury has healed is pretty high. And that means that you're even more uh, likely at that point where you need to re-engage in climbing, re-engage with hangboarding, and I, I end up green lighting people a lot to go back and start exercising again. So um, if you didn't have a, a, a significant injury moment, like an ankle sprain or like a pop where your finger tweaks, but you just had pain, it doesn't mean that something got hurt or damaged or injured. If the pain's been going on a long time, it's even less likely that you're still injured because the body heals and our bodies are amazing at healing. We're very fortunate that way. Um, welcome to everybody uh, who's just joining. Appreciate you uh, uh, showing up this afternoon. I'm Charlie Merrill, I'm PT in Boulder. And I'm going to um, do my best to share some things that I think are really novel and unique to climbers, things that you might not know yet. I wanna bust some myths and I maybe wanna show you some helpful strategies to fill in some of the home-based training that you're trying to do to uh, keep your fitness in this off period. So I just talked a little bit about um, pain science and if, if anyone heard that and has questions about that or wants me to clarify, I'm happy to do that. That'll be a thread that kind of runs through what I'm sharing today. Um, this time off, you guys, is really hard for all of us. Um, I, I, don't, I can't get a sense for those of you who are watching of who's still climbing at this point. Um, I'm not climbing much. You know, if I can get outside and find an empty crag, I'll do that, but I'm certainly training at home and I'm using this as an opportunity to work on weaknesses, build my cardiovascular system, continue to build my tendon and finger strength um, so that when, and, and we'll talk about this, but my shoulder, my shoulder blade strength so that when I get back to climbing, um, I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm have minimal risk for injury. So um, one of the big ideas that I wanted you to take away today, and there are a few questions about neck pain, um, is that the neck is, in ch is upstream, it's in charge of all of our symptoms downstream. And we've had a lot of questions about lateral elbow pain, medial elbow pain, super common as you know with climbers. Um, most climbers end up treating that at the elbow. They end up treating it as an elbow injury. And what I want you to take away from this today is that there's a lot of opportunity to treat the neck. There's a lot of opportunity to treat the shoulder. And what we find is sometimes even without touching the elbow, we can get the, these symptoms to change because we've cleaned up the upstream system. Um, all of the nerves and blood vessels that bring information, power, muscle power, blood flow, and uh, up and downstream start in your neck and have to travel through a number of tunnels to get down to your elbow and even into your hand. So if I have an athlete with a pulley injury in their finger and all I'm doing is treating their hand and fingers, I'm missing a massive opportunity to help that athlete and create change. 
So don't neglect the neck, don't neglect the shoulders. Um, and we'll talk about uh, the rotator cuff a little bit today as well. So um, just, a, just a, a big idea there that I, that I think is one of the most important, one of the most missed opportunities when it comes to people problem solving their own stuff is, uh, is making sure that you're addressing the neck and the shoulder. Hello, everyone just joining. Hello, hello, welcome. Um, still taking questions. The, the, the text on my phone is really small, so I'll do my best to kind of pay attention and, uh, and make sure I don't miss anything. <clears throat> so let's just start down this road of elbow pain because we have so many people that are asking about that. Um, let's start up at the neck and work our way down now that we know that this is a system um, and see what we can help you guys figure out. Um, I had one, we had one question about neck tension with bouldering, people having chronic neck pain, neck tension with bouldering. One of the reasons that happens is because um, bouldering is a very high tension sport compared to sport climbing or trad climbing. Powerful movements, as you know, recruiting a lot of muscle. And um, oftentimes we don't have the strength in our shoulders, especially, even if we have the strength in our fingers and forearms, we don't have the strength in our shoulders to be able to support that move. Or, or, or that movement. So we tend to shrug up, we tend to go up into our neck to try to find um, power. And that's, a, I would say, a substitution that's, that's, uh, that's not very biomechanically healthy. That loads up the neck with tension. You combine that with shallow breathing, and I know Brendan earlier this week was talking about the importance of breathing, but you combine that with this sort of shallow, high tension, breath hold, panic breathing that we get when we're really struggling on something. And those two things are the perfect storm to um, result in neck pain, tension, headaches. But honestly, even more than that, the compression that we see that causes symptoms downstream. So even that pattern that you see of people climbing where they're up here in their neck and they're really struggling, they're about to fall, let's say, that's gonna set people up more likely to have downstream stuff in their elbow and hands. So, um, there are tons of opportunities to, to um, address that stuff um, with the neck. If you're a sport climber, I know most of you are probably boulders, but taking care of your neck sometimes is as simple as just moving it between climbs through a circle, through a big circle to help to lubricate those joints, get movement in there, um, get blood flow, open that up. If you spend a lot of time um, looking up, belaying especially, make sure you're wearing belay glasses so that you're not doing this. Because what I see a lot is people spend all this time looking up, belaying their partner, and then it's their turn to climb and they have all this strain that's loaded up in their neck that makes them perform less well in their shoulders, elbows, and hands. So um, if you're, you know, we're all looking up a lot anyway, when we're bouldering, looking up to make the next move. When you get down off the wall, just take a second and stretch your neck out. Move it around in circles. Make sure that you're taking care of your neck because again, this is, the, this is like the circuit breaker of the whole system downstream. So mind that for sure. Um, the, the second most important area is sort of the fascia and all the tension around the shoulder. And I see this with CrossFit athletes a ton where they lose overhead range. They actually get stiffer because they're doing so many pull-up base movements and climbers are doing so much pulling, they're using their lats, um, which is such a dominant muscle group that it becomes difficult then to get that full overhead range. So one of the most simple solutions that I can show you to opening up the fascia and releasing tension through the nerves and blood vessels that come all the way down to your elbow and hand just uses a basic foam roller. So let me show you that first. And um, if you have a foam roller, which I think most people do, you can follow along. Hopefully you can all still hear me. Okay, guys, super simple. I don't know, so many people I show this to have this thing in their house and they just don't use it this way. So I'm just laying back with my head and my tailbone supported. I'm gonna slide my arms up overhead. And it's really important that you're going from 90 degrees and all the way up to your full overhead position. One of the reasons I love this so much is because there's a benchmark and the benchmark is, you can test yourself right now, is can you get your hands on the floor and even your forearms on the floor and keep them on the floor all the way overhead? And if you can't do that, it's a sign that your lats are a bit short and it's a sign that you need to open up the fascia around your pecs and all the way through your shoulder blade, okay? 
So I'd spend five to 10 minutes here each day just opening up all the connective tissue in there. Can you all still hear me okay? Just wanna make sure you can hear me. Thumbs up, cool. Um, so um, five to 10 minutes a day doing that, you'll, you'll probably get some numbness tingling in your hands. That's normal. You might lose some blood flow in your hands because things are getting compressed. That's normal. Um, and this is just like, like the easiest way to maintain day to day your shoulder health. So this is like number one solution, whether you have neck pain, shoulder pain, elbow pain, or hand pain. If you're not already doing this, um, start it today. If you just have one of those half rollers, use like a, a couple pillows for the bottom half and make sure that your head and your upper back are supported on your little shorty, um, section. Cool. You might even have some symptoms where your pain is, and that would be a really good sign that you're on the right track. Cool. Number two, same foam roller. This time you're going to turn it sideways. You're going to lie down over it. You're going to put your hands behind your head to support your head and your neck. Move up this way a little bit. I'm going to keep my hips really low to the ground and I'm going to let my head drop back over the foam roller to the ground. Cool. So I'm trying to take my spine, which is normally curved this way in my mid back, and I'm trying to make it curve the opposite direction. Cool. I can either work on one vertebrae and I can sort of hinge it to break it free, kind of like a rusty hinge. Um, or I can just um, roll up and down through the whole range from the base of my neck up to my mid back. It's like a big massage for your shoulder blade muscles and it'll make your ribs and mid back more flexible. Um, notice that my hips are low and my head is low. So I'm bending over the roll, trying to reverse the curvature of my uh, thoracic spine. You know, how many climbers do we see walking around between climbs that are like this and they're like this and they're like looking up at their friend and we wonder why our necks are bothering us and we wonder why we can't like get full range of motion, you know? If we can get mobility through this part of the spine, suddenly we have this great ability to reach overhead and the health, the day-to-day -day health of our neck and of our shoulders is um, significantly better. So those are gonna be my two favorite like starting mobility exercises for maintaining health of the whole entire extremity. And for those of you that are just joining, brief summary, um, anytime you have finger, hand, wrist, or elbow pain, if you're neglecting the neck and you're neglecting the shoulder, you're missing a huge opportunity to get yourself relief. Cool? Um, the second thing I want to talk about is scapular or shoulder blade control. And a lot of people talk about the rotator cuff. Um, the rotator cuff is a, a very small set of four muscles that come off the shoulder blade and surround the sort of ball and socket joint. The whole purpose of the rotator cuff is to control the quality of movement between the ball and the socket. So as your arms moving into different positions and you're grabbing onto holds, sometimes even in funny positions, the purpose of your cuff is to make sure the ball doesn't spin out or drop out of the socket. That's really all it does. So they're like puppet strings and they're very small and they're not big powerful muscles like your lats. They're not meant to be worked out with massive weights, okay? Um, this is another myth that we see in shoulder pain is that climbers assume that if their rotator cuff hurts, if the rotator cuff is injured, that it must be a rotator cuff problem. And while the pain might be coming from there, the problem is usually not. And we have to look at the shoulder blade. The shoulder blade is kind of the flat bone here on the back of your ribs that you can't see. Shoulder blades are really strange because, because we can't see them, it's really hard to know where they are in space. We have two of them. And again, th this is the bone, the flat bone that sits on our ribs that all four of the rotator cuff muscles start from and then they attach onto the ball, okay? So we have this one control system at the ball and socket joint, but we have a whole nother control system that just controls the movement of the shoulder blades. And it's that system that tends to be the most faulty when it comes to shoulder pain and honestly, even elbow and hand and wrist pain. So to simplify this, um, I want you to consider um, warming up the shoulder blade muscles, learning how to feel where the shoulder blade muscles are in space, and um, tr doing things to activate them, not only day to day, but especially now while we have this break, because what you're going to find is you're going to come back stronger, you're going to start sending stuff that you never thought you could send. We find that most climbers have really great hand strength, 
finger strength, but they're lacking this sort of core shoulder blade scapular strength that they need um, to really climb at a higher level. And this becomes a limiting factor. Um, so we'll talk about that in just a second. I just want to um, go through a number of what are sort of my favorite warm-ups. Um, I use these in the gym. Um, I use them at home. I realize not everybody has a set of rings, so we'll talk about some alternatives. But if you have rings, a pull-up bar, TRX straps, um, uh, if you can figure out a way to sort of rig this up in your house, uh, it's, it's a fantastic way to, to gain awareness. Um, when you get back to the gym, I encourage you to do this every time you go climb, um, even just 10 reps of these as a warm up to, uh, to get you ready for that session. So I'm going to use a set of rings today. And y'all, I know we just met, but I'm going to take my shirt off so that I can show you better what I want you to do. Get my microphone back here. Forgot that was attached. Sweet. I'm going to connect this to my ear and see if I can tolerate it. Yeah, oh, can y'all hear me okay still? You cool? Okay, so... We're gonna start with what I consider a scapular uh, engagement. It's like a scapular pull-up, and maybe some of you have done this before. So I'm gonna hang passively, which is with my shoulder blades relaxed, and then I'm gonna engage my shoulder blades and I'm gonna pull them down and together, okay? So I'm engaging, and then I'm relaxing, and then I'm engaging, and then I'm relaxing, okay? And what I'm doing is I'm pulling into my mid-back I'm engaging the muscles that go down uh, from my shoulder blades down to my low back, and I'm taking the tension out of my neck, okay? What I see a lot in climbers, if you guys can see this okay, is when they go to do a pull-up, they oftentimes start with their shoulder blades in this relaxed position, and they're pulling up in a shrug, right? They're pulling up in a shrug position. Some of them know enough to be able to engage before they do their pull, and then they go to pull, and they completely come unlocked. They completely come disengaged, okay? Can you see that? So I'm engaging, I'm trying, and then I'm like, oh, that's really hard, okay? So that's what I see in a lot of climbers um, when I'm evaluating them for injury problems. Um, what I like to see, if you can see the difference here, is I like to see them engage and then initiate their pull, okay? So I'm engaging and then doing my pull. Nice, strong pull. Um, once you can do that, once you can get that engagement of your scapula and then pull, you're going to find that you have a much less stress in your elbows and in your um, fingers and hands. So um, one of the other uh, nuances of this movement is that I see a lot of climbers who have a hard time doing this without wanting to pull from their elbows. So I'll say, engage your shoulder blades and they'll want to start pulling from their elbows, right? Instead of leaving the elbows straight and just doing the shoulder blade part. And this gets back to this idea that uh, mo most climbers tend to be elbow dominant climbers. This is their go-to joint to start their pull. And it really shouldn't be, it really should be the shoulder blades that go first and then the elbow and the hand sort of support that, back it up. But this is why, um, a lot of breath. This is why the elbow gets overloaded and why the hands get overloaded because it doesn't have the support of more of the trunk muscles. Um, does that make sense to everybody? See some hearts, sort of thumbs up. If everybody's kind of getting the big idea here. Um, hello, hello, anybody there? I think there's a little delay. Nice, everyone's getting it. Um, there's a second um, version that I want you to try of this. And that is, I'm gonna lower these rings a little bit. It's essentially a ring row. And um, a ring row is a lot like a pull-up, except it sort of reproduces what you'd feel on an overhanging climb. Something that was a bit um, more upside down. So let's say here I am, I'm, you know, I'm climbing on a, in a cave. Uh, what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to engage my shoulder blades like this. This is a shoulder blade row. 
instead of a shoulder blade pull up. So the full row would be shoulder blades and then row, right? And then relax. This is me like recovering, resting. I'm chalking up. I'm getting ready to, to go to the next move. Before I do that, I'm going to engage and then I'm going to pull. And this is how you get those shoulder blade muscles more coordinated. You become aware of them and they become your sort of initiation of that pulling movement. Now notice again, I'm just doing the shoulder blade. A lot of climbers want to start to pull with their elbows because they're so used to doing that. And maybe their shoulder blades are completely in the wrong position, right? Like this, instead of like this. I always think of like Superman ripping the shirt open. I'm engaging the shoulder blades and then I'm pulling with my elbow and hand. Um, eventually, you get better at this. You can even do it with one arm. So I'm chalking, chalking up, I'm resting, right? I'm breathing, I'm getting ready to go. Before I go to pull for that next hold, I'm gonna engage my shoulder blade, right? I'm gonna pull my shoulder blade towards my spine, down toward my hip. I'm gonna pull my hip into the wall, and then I'm gonna pull for that next hold, right? Notice, by the time I get here, I'm already halfway to that next hold. I haven't even started bending my elbow yet, right? So another opportunity to work on scapular control um, in those situations where you're more overhanging, the, the harder the climb gets, um, the more you need that, that uh, strength upside down. Last shoulder blade activation strategy here. Again, for those, for those of you who are just joining, we're talking about ways to get the shoulder blade muscles activated to take stress off of the rotator cuff, if it's irritated, off of the elbow, and off of the hand, okay? So this is number three. Now we're working in, in, a, working in antagonist muscle. So we're gonna work on the shoulder blades um, reaching apart, right? There are a lot of times climbing when we're hanging on that shoulder blade, when the shoulder blade is here, because we're resting or whatever, and we want the shoulder blade to be strong in that position so we can resist it, right? So there's like a shoulder blade push up coming here instead of here. When I'm here, my shoulder blades are together, they're unstable, they're weak. When I'm here, they're activated, they're strong, and they're ready for um, any pushing movements we might do, like a push up. So, what I don't want to see is relaxed shoulder blades and doing push ups like this. I'd like to see them activated like that. And then every time you come back up, you reset your shoulder blades into what we call protraction and then go from there. Cool. So, those are my three favorite warm up uh, shoulder blade exercises. For those of you just joining, I'm Charlie Merrill, physical therapist here in Boulder, talking about how we can prevent elbow, hand, finger injuries by making sure we're really aware of and engaging our shoulder blade muscles. Um, also takes the stress off the rotator cuff. Two more things I wanna show you guys. Uh, maybe, maybe you've seen this, but these are a little bit more obscure. We have two really important shoulder blade, shoulder blade muscles that are antagonist to the lats. And the lats are our big pulling muscle that allow us to pull on holes, lock off. Those lats, because they attach to the front of the shoulder, have this forward pull to the shoulder, which is why a lot of climbers end up like this, right? Instead of with this nice upright posture. So as the lats get dominant and short and tight, they'll pull us here, and then we'll have a really hard time doing things um, that are powerful with our shoulders without the risk of hurting something downstream. So these muscles in the back of the shoulder blade here are called the low traps. And this muscle that wraps around uh, into our armpit called serratus anterior are two muscles that we can really work on that are very easy to do that will really help our performance. So if any of you have one of these, it's relatively light. If you don't, um, just take a piece of band or tubing and Maybe it's eight inches long, tie it together. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna pull apart with my hands, pull my elbows in, 
so my forearms are vertical. And then I'm gonna slide my arms like I'm going up the wall, completely overhead, okay? I'm not shrugging, I'm relaxing my neck. And as I come back down, I'm gonna pull my elbows back in, okay? So it's pull hands apart, pull the elbows in, slide up. Now you don't really need the band. You can see how hard this is for me. Um, it's really challenging, even with this light band. So even sometimes the act of pulling those forearms vertical is enough to engage the shoulder blade muscles that are opposite your lats, okay? Pull apart, elbows in, slide up, a little harder on my left side, and then back down. If you do 10 of these as a warm-up before you climb, you're, you're solid, you're gonna be psyched, okay? Um, the next one we're gonna talk about is your low, low trap. So that was serratus anterior, this is low trap, and again, the low trap comes from your shoulder blades down to your mid-back. It's the opposite of your upper trap, which for those of you that have neck pain um, is the one that's driving a lot of that neck pain, okay? So this is the same muscle, upper trap and lower trap. They're just different parts of the same muscle. I even, I think I have a picture here I can show you. Let's see if y'all can see this. Sweet. So this is your upper trap. This is why your neck gets tense. This is looking from the back, looking at your shoulder blades here and here. And this is your low trap, comes down into your mid-back. All the rotator cuff muscles are these little tiny muscles coming off the shoulder blades. Shoulder blade, these bigger muscles are the ones that cover the shoulder blade and control its movement. So this would be what it would look like if you took off all these big shoulder blade muscles. It would look stripped down like this. Anyway, this is the low trap, the one we're gonna be talking about, how we can get into it. And just know that um, the most important cue at getting this to fire, getting this V-shape that looks really nice, but that also functions really well, is to actually relax the upper trap. So we don't need to be pulling down, because that fires the lat, which if you're a climber is already working really hard. We don't wanna be pulling down with the lat we literally just wanna be relaxing the upper trap and using that as our cue. Once we do that, this muscle will fire, cool? So here's the deal. You're gonna stand, I'll show you a couple different, different directions. The first thing you're gonna do is hinge. That way we have a little gravity working against us. And then we're gonna come up into um, uh, what I call a victory position or a V position, cool? My thumbs are to the ceiling. Tendency for a lot of people is to shrug like this. I want you to be able to relax your neck and let that be super soft, okay? I'm not pulling down with my lat. I'm literally just relaxing the tension out of my neck. It's easier, uh, sorry, I say it's harder than it looks. It's a very subtle cue, okay? From this way, you can do a hip hinge, arms overhead, relax the neck. And once you get the tension out of here, you're gonna feel a lot of firing in your mid back. Okay, you can repeat that, hold five seconds, back up, hold five seconds, relax the neck, back up. Go through, you know, when I warm up, I do 10 or 15 of these, and you'll feel that burning down through your mid-back in such a good way. Cool. Um, one of the other um, common warm-ups that I see climbers do a lot is, is grabbing a band pulling apart this way at different heights, right? All the way up overhead. I'm a big fan of that movement, although it does work the lats a lot. It will get you into your mid back and get some of those muscles activated, especially if you're above shoulder height, if you're between here and here. So I like to focus that pulling more up in this range. And same cue, I'm relaxing my shoulder blades, relaxing my neck so they're not over firing, I'm not shrugging like this. Cool? Um, <clears throat> all of these things are also appropriate, by the way, when you're hangboarding. So if you have a hangboard at your house, it's a great opportunity to work on um, some of the scapular control when you're hanging from your hangboard. Or as people have been talking a little bit about this week, when you're hanging from like the top of a door jam, <laughs> which is a nice alternative to a hangboard for those of you that don't have that. Um, cool. 
Um, I haven't seen any questions come up. Um, creative ways to hang a hangboard. Um, you know, Brendan talked about this earlier this week. I'd encourage you to go back. Um, his, his video will be up on YouTube at some point. Um, one of the things I sometimes do is use the door jam and the ledge on the door jam to be able to hang, especially if you have a sturdy enough door jam. You can get into that nice half crimp position and you can start training your fingers. If that's not deep enough for you, get another piece of wood, nail it up there, and then you have a little bit more depth to be able to um, not have such a small ledge. If you can ease the, ease the edge of the front edge of the trim, um, that's great. The nice thing about this is even if you are in a rental, if you pull the thing off there, all you have is a couple little nail holes um, at the top of the trim. If that's not an option, this is just a two by four. I would take a two by four and same thing, I would mount it above the, the trim, uh, put some nails through there, and then you have a ledge that you can use um, to hang from, and you can even um, use it to, to pinch with the thumb a little bit. But this gives you plenty of depth to be able to get into either an open hand or a half crimp. Um, these are just like really low budget options for hangboarding. Cool. So I shared with you guys um, sort of my conceptualization around the shoulder blade and the rotator cuff. Um, let's see what else we have here. A lot of climbers talk about antagonist training. Um, keep asking questions, you guys, if you have them. I'm happy to, uh, to just continue to chip away at those in between here. A lot of climbers talk about antagonist training. What they mean by that is um, you know, if the bicep is the primary pulling muscle um, in climbers, the tricep doesn't tend to get as much work, right? That's the opposite side of the upper arm. So it, this would be the antagonist, the opposite to the bicep. If we're using primarily our finger flexors and this part of our forearm to climb, our extensors are the antagonist and they don't tend to get as much um, work. If we're talking about the lats, which we just sort of covered here a minute ago, the shoulder blade muscles are the antagonist to the lat. And this is why we're always wanting to, to have some balance in how much we're working those sort of weaker, less used antagonist muscles. What we find is if, if there's too much of an imbalance, not only do you not make gains, so let's use your bicep as an example, your bicep will only get as strong as your tricep will allow it to. And you'll hit a point where if your tricep doesn't get stronger, your bicep's not gonna get much stronger. Same thing in your forearms. If your wrist extensors aren't keeping up, your wrist flexors are only gonna have so much power. And that's because your brain knows that um, it can't build any more muscle safely without risking injury. That's not to say um, you're completely limited, if you're training really hard, but t an injury tends to show up to sort of um, hang you up in that way. So easy stuff you can do at home to work on antagonist muscles at this point. Um, Push-ups, no brainer. Overhead presses, you know, pressing with a dumbbell or any household object that has a little bit of weight, pressing overhead is a wonderful way to not only reinforce good mobility, um, it'll also um, reinforce that the lat is not restricting end range, especially if you combine it with the foam roller stuff we did earlier. And, um, and again, it's really gonna, it's gonna actually help your pulling strength to develop pushing strength. And I know that's kind of an abstract concept. Um, when you talk about the fingers and the forearms, you know, household rubber bands are a very easy way to train your finger extensors. And I'll often do this, a lot of this stuff I'll do as a warm up before I boulder, before I climb this type of thing. Um, and it just really warms up and gets activation and almost shortens the extensors. We tend to do so much that shortens our flexors. And so the extensors on the backside tend to get a little long. So any way we can ex shorten the extensors on the backside of the elbow, um, the better. Especially when we have lateral elbow pain, this is a good time to start working on activating, getting blood flow, and restoring some health back in this compartment of muscles while you're then doing things to elongate the flexors. Um, that makes sense to y'all. Um, let's see, good exercises for hip abductor strains 
when doing super high feet. So I assume that means you're talking about you're getting strain sort of in this upper part of your butt, this upper part of your glute. Um, climbers actually use their legs, especially boulders, quite a bit, and I tend to rely on heel hooking a lot. Um, I tend to rely on high stepping uh, quite a lot. So, so yes, there are a number of other like warm up exercises that I use to make sure my hip abductors are firing well. I'll show you a couple basic ones that I really like. Um, and again, don't like don't like feel like you need to do a ton of this stuff. This is just like good activation, good warm up work. First thing I'll do before I climb is I'll stand on one leg, which gets my abductors firing on this side. And then I'll bring the other leg up as high as I can with my hands. And then I'll let go and get used to trying to hold it there. And I'll hold it for five seconds and then I'll bring it back down. It tends to really strain in here. But what you're doing is you're training these muscles to be able to hold you in that shortened position against gravity at their end range, which you'll find very hard. I'm gonna pull up and out. So I started here, do one there. I'm gonna do one there and I'm gonna do one out in abduction and I'm gonna really hold it. Oh, it's really hard to do there, okay? And then you'll do the other side, front, hold, five seconds, out, hold, five seconds, far out, ah, hold, five seconds. And on the stance side, I'm also getting a lot of glute activation, um, which is really nice. Let's see, one more quick, let's see, how can I show you guys this? One more quick progression. Um, this I have um, on my YouTube channel which I think is Merrill Performance Boulder. This is one of my favorite activation exercises for glute and hip stuff. And I use this with runners a lot too. It's just, this is essentially the rotator cuff of your hip. So these muscles also have an important role in controlling the position of your hip joint when you're doing things like high stepping. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lie on my side and I'm gonna go through a series of five movements. I'm gonna do five reps of each, okay? First one is heels together. This is Jane Fonda style for those of you that are old enough like me to remember Jane Fonda. Maybe you had a crush on her at some point. Heels together, five reps. Knees together, five reps. As much range of motion as I can get. I'm just waking up these muscles in my hip, getting them activated, reminding them how to do their job. Heels apart. It's the same as the first movement, but without my heels touching. I'm gonna do five of those. Okay, and then we're gonna go knees apart. It's the same as the second movement, but without the knees touching. Okay, back into internal rotation. That's movement four. And then movement five, I'm extending my leg and I'm going through internal rotation, external rotation. Okay, now there's nothing saying you can't bring this up here where you'd be high stepping and working on the same exact rotation control exercise against gravity. Um, and then you'll repeat that up to five rounds. And I like this again, because it has a benchmark. If you can get through five rounds of this, knees together, without fatiguing, without too much shaking, um, hit me up, send me a message, I'll be very impressed. Once you can get there, your hips are solid, you're ready to run, you're ready to do just about anything, climbing, you'll be pretty bomb proof in your hips, okay? Five reps, five movements, and then just keep going until you're tired. It could be three rounds, could be five rounds. Um, I have to tell you guys, one of the most fun things in my practice is trying to find ways to make this stuff playful. And if any of you have ever used a hacky sack, it's a nice soft hacky sack, it's one of my favorite ways to get the hips warmed up before climbing. Um, you don't have to be really good at it to do this and you can even do it by yourself. But what I like about it is you can just practice kicking it back to yourself. That's my high step right there, right? I'm getting right up into that position. I can practice kicking it off the outside of my foot. So I'm getting used to a drop knee, right? And getting the muscles strong there. I can kick it off the inside of my foot, back to myself. And this is that sort of awkward position that sometimes we get up into uh, when we're trying to high step or use our heel in some awkward way. And I'm, I'm touching all those positions in a functional way that's kind of fun. Do both legs, obviously, um, but that really will reinforce your hips. Um, let's see, second toe pain, that's about to go out of the screen here. 
both feet from climbing in shoes that were too aggressive. Anything I do to rehab this, prevent it in the future. You know, shoes, um, I have a long second toe, maybe like you, I don't know if that's how your foot is shaped, but my second toe is my longest. Um, I fit really well into Scarpa shoes as a result. Just the shape of the toe of the shoe is just better for my feet. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm um, an aggressive enough climber to demand my shoe be too, too small. So I tend to wear a shoe in the bouldering gym that I can wear for like 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, you know, a bunch of problems before I take them off. Um, especially when I'm training in the gym, I would say save those super tight shoes for uh, sending day or when you're out um, doing a project that you really need to perform well on. Um, otherwise, I would say, you know, just avoid crushing those toes too, too much day to day and in training. Um, uh, I, I yank on my toes a lot to decompress them after climbing. I'll crack them, I'll pull on them. There's no harm in that. And I'll also wear yoga toes or just toe spacers that are like these silicone gel things that go between toes to, to separate them, to stretch them out. And I find those feel really nice um, after climbing as well. Just remember, if you missed the beginning of this, just because things hurt doesn't mean they're injured. So you can have some sensitivity in that toe from your shoes and you don't need to be worried that you're doing any damage um, to that. Uh, let's see. What do you do about persistent um, finger joint pain that doesn't involve taping and stopping climbing altogether? Um, in case you just joined, um, I'm Charlie Merrill, I'm a physical therapist in Boulder. Um, I appreciate you all being here. When we started, I talked about the idea that um, pain does not mean that you're damaged. Pain does not mean that you have an injury. So we can have pain anywhere in our body and have no injury whatsoever. And a lot of climbers get scared to go back and start re-engaging in climbing because they're worried that they're going to damage something. So while it's important to go see somebody who can help you rule out a true injury that needs to be cared for, most of the time engaging with climbing at some level uh, is actually the way to get through the pain. In other words, stopping climbing is not usually helpful. Um, tape can be helpful in the short term. Tape can be helpful to allow you to re-engage in climbing at the start, but then you wanna wean off of that at some point. And like any activity, when you haven't done it in a while, especially if you've had a break more than a month, you wanna to start to re-engage slowly and just monitor how it's progressing. Um, you might have more pain, and that's okay, as long as it doesn't stay flared up for too long. Um, you'll, you'll, um, I think you'll find that it calms down fast enough that you can then um, repeat and gradually build up intensity um, until you're back to climbing. So I guess like, you know, those of you who have completely stopped climbing because you're injured, I think it's really important that you talk to somebody that can give you the confidence that you're either healed or you can start training in some way uh, as you continue to heal if there's an injury. And I'll just say briefly, my, um, uh, because of COVID, I'm doing free 15 minute consultations um, for athletes, for climbers, for, for any athlete, um, and especially for y'all. Um, you can book that uh, probably going through my Instagram account, which is at Charlie Merrill, and there's a link in my profile to book in a, a 15 minute spot so we can chat one on one, because it's really hard sometimes to give people really good advice um, in this way on an Instagram live where we're not quite able to connect the way maybe we would like to. Um, let's see, any other questions on here? We have about 10 minutes left. We talked about antagonist training, we talked about toes, we talked about fingers. Um, who here, who's running? Is anybody running to maintain their fitness during this break? Like send some hearts up or give some thumbs up for those of you that are using running or some type of cardiovascular training right now. I think like most runners hate, hate running. I mean, sorry, most climbers hate running. That's my experience. I started as a runner before I was a climber. So I've always been, I feel like running like cardiovascular fitness for me is, is a, um, a really big important part of my, my performance as a climber. Um, for those of you that are running, I think it's great that you're taking this opportunity. And I think you're going to find that when you get back to climbing, a couple things. Number one, um, climbing is a really skill intensive sport. And I want you all to trust that you're probably not going to lose 
a lot of your skill in this break. You might lose some conditioning, you might lose some fitness, but that's gonna come back relatively fast. Those of you that have been climbing for a while, more than a couple years, a lot of that skill is already sort of in your nervous system, in your body. It's like riding a bike. So that's gonna come back relatively fast. And then the finger strength and stuff, you know, you can maintain a lot of that while you're on this break. Um, the more you can sort of touch things during the week, like you can hangboard a little bit, you can activate your shoulder blades a little bit, you can do some mobility work, um, maybe you can do some pull-ups or some other basic strength training, even a little bit of that's gonna go a long way at you re-engaging and climbing when things reopen at the end of this. So that fear and anxiety that we have about like, ah, I can't do this, I can't train, I know that's really hard, but you have to trust that at the end of this you're gonna be okay. Um, uh, cardiovascular fitness is a really, um, it's a really underlooked type of fitness with climbers. I've seen my wife, who's a 513 plus sport climber, get to the point on projects where she's breathing so hard that she falls because she's at her VO2 max. You know, she's reached the high, the high end of her conditioning for that climb. And of course she feels pumped and she's tired and her whole body feels tired. But by building more cardiovascular fitness, she's found that she has more endurance on these climbs um, than she ever had before. So things like running, cycling, rowing, uh, jumping rope, um, you know, power hiking, uh, doing interval training, these are all great ways that we can all do right now to build up our cardiovascular conditioning, which is not only good for our overall health, but it's also good for our climbing. I just wanna show you one quick thing. Um, that everybody can do. If you have a old climbing rope, when I go to movement to the, to the gym here, this is one of my favorite ways to warm up. I have a section of climbing rope. This one's pretty light. And I'll use it to jump rope. And I'll cut a length that's, if I step on one end, I'll cut a length that's like up to my armpit or a little taller. And then I can take this thing, and it's a little heavy, and I can jump, right? What I love about this is it warms up my hands and wrists, it warms up my shoulders, it gets everything hot, kind of activated, ready to go. It's a great movement for runners because it gets your calves sort of used to the idea of impact. So it's a great starting point if you're gonna be running more to condition your feet, start to condition your lower legs, get them used to the impact. Um, and it gets your heart rate up. Like it's just, it's such a great cardiovascular workout. So I'd encourage all of you to take an old rope, make a jump rope out of it and Make that something that you try to do um, regularly, often, uh, uh, re relatively regularly. Um, we only have a few more minutes here. I wanna show you guys one more thing that I really like as a preventive strategy. There are so many things to talk about, we'll have to do this again, but um, this is one of these long bands, if you guys have one of these. I love the feeling of putting that over my neck, over my shoulder blade, and stepping down on the other end. It pulls, oh, I got my microphone there. Sorry about that. Do the other side. It pulls down on all the upper structures that tend to be shrugged from climbing a lot, and it creates space as all these nerves and blood vessels exit the shoulder. So you can, you can do some mobility overhead, you can hang from a pull-up bar, um, and the band pulling down just feels so nice. You can also use it as a way to fascially pin the muscles that attach onto your upper ribs and open that up too so we get space through this system. Again, the headwaters of everything that happens downstream in your forearm and hand, you can create space through that whole system. And um, you, know, you spend a minute here and it just feels really nice um, to open up all that fascia. Like climbers, have the most tension. It's just incredible how much tension they develop in their neck from shallow breathing and breath holding um, and from high intensity, you know, t high tension bouldering. So it's a, it's a great strategy. Um, last thing I'll say is that there are lots of tools for working on your forearms, hands. We have scraping tools that you can use to scrape the fascia. This is called a fascia blaster. It's kind of a crazy looking thing. You can sit there and you can massage your forearm using this tool. Um, check that out. Everyone probably knows the arm aid. You got this guy. This is the new version. You sort of hold it closed and you can sit there and work on trigger points, work on fascia. With all this stuff, if you add in some hand stuff, wrist stuff, 
and even do a little torquing on the muscle. It'll really help break up that fascia. And then the last thing is this guy. This is the R8 roller. It's got roller blade wheels on it. And you can sit there and you can smash in to your forearms and hands. Again, move your wrist around. Get some nice release in there. Um, gosh, you guys, I feel like I uh, could go on all day. I really appreciate you all showing up today. And um, thanks to Brooklyn Boulders for hosting me. Um, we have just a couple minutes left. If anyone has like one last comment or one last uh, question they want me to answer, I'll do that. But in the meantime, I mostly just want to say thank you. Super grateful to be able to connect with all of you at this time when we're all separate and we can't climb and it's such a bummer, but what a cool opportunity to, to share some things that um, I share in my clinic with my clients every day. And I find myself wishing like, gosh, if only I could share this with, with more people, um, with more climbers, it would just be incredible because I just see, you know, every day I'm in the clinic, how these little, these little bite-sized like nuggets of information, even just debunking some myths are so massively powerful in helping climbers move past things in their elbows and their hands and their fingers and their shoulders, like things that have, have held them back and have created fear for years. Um, just these little nuggets go so far. So while some of this seems really simple, I want you guys to, um, to try it, uh, to try this stuff and give me some feedback, give Brooklyn Boulder some feedback to, um, um, uh, about what you thought. Um, just one last reminder, 15 minute free consults. Um, I'd love to connect with you individually. If you have just basic questions or clarifications you want to make, um, you can book that at Charlie Merrill is my Instagram handle. And in my profile, you can book that there. Merrill performance is my practice. I hope I'm back, um, up and running here in the next few months. But in the meantime, um, I'm going to be sharing a ton of information through Brooklyn Boulders. I have a ton of information in my, on my YouTube channel at Merrill, Merrill Performance Boulder. It's all free. Some of the stuff we talked about today is in there. And um, uh, everyone, be safe, take care of yourselves, be healthy, and we'll all be climbing again soon. Peace.